Hello and welcome everyone, my name is Robius and today I bring you a new episode of Assassin's Creed The Real History, the series where we compare the representations of characters and other elements depicted within one of the Assassin's Creed games to their actual history. Please be warned of major story spoilers ahead. For today's episode, I'll be covering the history of the military officer Gilbert Dumoitier, Marquis de Lafayette, also simply known as Lafayette for short. To start, we will explore his early life during the pre-game history, then we will cover his life in Assassin's Creed 3 during the in-game history, and lastly we will summarize the differences between his actual life and his portrayal in the game. Starting with the pre-game history, Marie-Joseph Paul-Yves Roch Gilbert du Moitié de Lafayette was born on September 6, 1757 to Michel-Louis Christophe Roch Gilbert Paulette du Moitié and Marie-Louise Jolie de la Rivière at the Château de Chavagnac. In 1759, at the age of two, Gilbert was made the new Lord of Chavagnac following his father's death in the Battle of Minden. By 1770, Gilbert had lost his mother, his grandfather, and his uncle, leaving him in a position of extensive wealth. In his youth, he was raised by his grandmother and studied at the Collège du Plessis until 1771, where he trained to become an officer at the Musketeers of Military Household of the King of France. In 1775, Lafayette became interested in the American Revolution and thought that the French should be involved. By December of the following year, without the needed permissions, he entered the American service as a major general with the help of his Parisian contact. He briefly visited England where he met certain political figures and refused to toast King George, soon after returning to France. Despite the French government forbidding him to leave under penalty of arrest, Lafayette purchased a ship disguised himself as a woman and succeeded in reaching South Carolina by mid-1777. When some complications arose concerning his pay, the Frenchman told the Americans he would work without compensation and was made a major general. Then, with Benjamin Franklin's recommendation, Lafayette met and joined Washington's forces. During his earlier involvement in the American Revolution, he participated in the battles at Brandywine and Barren Hill. This is the point where we first met Lafayette in Assassin's Creed III when he was stationed at Valley Forge with Washington's forces. Soon after, he participated in the battle at Monmouth, which was also depicted in AC3 when he notified Washington of Charles Lee's erratic commands. Overall, through his participation in military confrontations, he became known for his strategic prowess. Lafayette was also recognized for recruiting the Oneida tribe to the Americans' cause, and it was in part thanks to his actions that France recognized American independence in 1778. He later participated both in welcoming the French fleet to America and calming the Boston riots with the aid of John Hancock. Upon his 1779 return to Paris, he was put under house arrest for eight days in reason of his defiance to the government by going to America. He was then released, eventually meeting King Louis XVI, and with the help of Franklin they secured more ships to attack the British and organized 6,000 soldiers to be led by General Jean-Baptiste de Rochambeau to aid the Americans. Soon after, his wife, Adrienne, whom he married in 1774, gave birth to their son, George Washington Lafayette. In 1780, Gilbert returned to the United States, at which point he received more military responsibility and participated in the Battle of Green Spring and the Siege of Yorktown, which had the French fleet blockading the British that led to General Cornwallis's eventual surrender in 1781. Lafayette returned to France later that year and was proclaimed a national hero. He then negotiated with Thomas Jefferson, establishing trade agreements between France and the United States. Lafayette then lobbied for the end of slavery and the equal rights of all men, even urging Washington to emancipate the American slaves. Unfortunately, his requests were denied. In 1784, he returned to America and visited most of the states, speaking of the liberty of all mankind and visiting Mohawk Valley, where he had peace negotiations with the Iroquois nations, some of whom he'd already met. In thanks for his role in their independence, the Americans granted him citizenship in Maryland, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Virginia. In 1786, when the French fiscal crisis neared its peak, Lafayette was used as the monarchy's mouthpiece for lowering the country's debt when representing the nobility during the Estates General. As the National Assembly was created, Lafayette was one of its first members. He participated in drafting the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, and was elected Vice President of the Assembly. Unfortunately, the very next day the Bastille was stormed. Following this confrontation between citizens and state, Lafayette was made Commander-in-Chief of the National Guard of France. In this position, he was tasked with keeping peace in this time of crisis. In June of 1791, after the royal family's failed attempt to flee to Varennes, Lafayette was blamed by Robespierre for being a collaborator, branding him a traitor to the people. Despite most likely being innocent in this case, his reputation was greatly tarnished. As chaos broke out, martial law was established in Paris, and Lafayette led the National Guard, trying to keep peace. The chaos escalated in violence, leading to the Shah de Mal's massacre, where Lafayette's men fired into the protesting crowds led by the later Jacobin leaders. 
In reason of this failure, Lafayette resigned from the National Guard. When war against Austria was declared in 1792, Lafayette was given charge of part of the French army and following multiple defeats, he and Rochambeau asked the assembly to negotiate peace. He soon returned to Paris, wanting to eliminate the radical clubs, like the Jacobins, and protect the monarchy and assembly, however many thought that he wanted to lead a coup d'etat. Returning to his army, Lafayette was contacted by the National Convention, who had seized the power of the French government from the king. They asked for his allegiance, but he refused, claiming that they should all be arrested for their unlawful seizure of power. He was subsequently relieved of his military command and was later branded a traitor. Knowing he would be guillotined by the extremists if captured, Lafayette and many other nobles fled, but were captured by Austrian and Prussian coalition troops in the southern Netherlands. In late 1792, Lafayette, among others, was eventually branded a prisoner of state for his role in the French Revolution. He was kept imprisoned until 1794, when his captors transferred him to Austrian hands, where he was once again sent from prison to prison. International supporters from Philadelphia, Hamburg-Altona, Paris, and London lobbied for his release. With the help of some allies whom he had made in the American Continental Army, a multilingual agent named Justus Eric Bullman made contact with Lafayette, and with the assistance of a medical student named Francis Kinlock Huger, they managed to help Gibal to escape. Unfortunately, he was recognized by a tanner in the town, who reported it to the town's mayor, who later had him recaptured. With the help of the Americans, Lafayette's family was kept alive, but was still in prison from 1792 to 1795, after the fall of Robespierre and the Jacobin Club. His son was sent to safety in America while his wife and daughters traveled to the German states and were allowed to join Lafayette in his prison for two years. In 1797, a young general named Napoleon Bonaparte negotiated the release of Lafayette and other prisoners, ending his five-year entrapment. As he was still considered a political rival of the French directors, he was not allowed back in France, but instead remained in the Danish province of Holstein until the events of Napoleon's coup d'etat took place, when he was finally able to return home. However, he did not want to serve in Napoleon's army, and therefore resigned from his military position. Following Napoleon's creation of an empire, Lafayette refused to participate in any new forms of government, instead lobbying for the liberty of France's people. After the Louisiana Purchase, he was offered a governing position in the United States by Thomas Jefferson, however he declined due to familial complications which ultimately culminated with the death of his wife in 1807. After the events of the Hundred Days, Lafayette participated in the 1815 Charter which had Napoleon abdicate from his position once again. Between 1824 and 1825, Lafayette went on tour of all 24 American states by invitation of President James Monroe. In his later life, upon returning to France and following the reinstation of the French monarchy, Lafayette became more involved with politics once again. In 1830, following the establishment of a committee as an interim government, Lafayette was offered the position of dictator, which he refused, and instead Louis-Philippe took control of the country. In 1834, Lafayette became very sick from pneumonia and, on May 20th of the same year, he died while in Paris and was buried next to his wife under soil from Bunker Hill, which was brought to him from America by his son. He was given a military funeral to which many citizens objected since they all wanted to be a part of the event. In summary, since Lafayette only made a few appearances in Assassin's Creed, much of the context around his participation in the story was accurate, although there were a few minor differences. First, although he did play a role in the Battle of Monmouth, he was not supported by Connor in saving the American troops. In addition, it was he, not the fictional assassin, who warned Washington of Lee's irregular commands. Secondly, although he may have been involved with the French naval preparations, he was not involved in an infiltration attack on New York or a strike against Fort George. Lastly, and this isn't really a difference in the game's portrayal, but I must say that I was a little disappointed to not see him portrayed in Unity during his involvement in the French Revolution. However, despite his brief appearances, I believe the game truly showed off the commitment and charisma of the man who helped found the two lasting nations of the United States and France. With that final thought, we have finished another episode of Assassin's Creed The Real History. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and if you did, I highly recommend you try out one of the Assassin's Creed games. Thank you all for watching. Please leave any suggestions for future characters, groups, events, or locations from any of the Assassin's Creed games that you'd like me to cover in the comment section below. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and I look forward to seeing you all in a future historical episode.